Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Dave. Uh, I'm the pastor here at JCC. Uh, glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, I, I know it's raining. Uh, I believe it's still raining, but we're still going to have uh, our Memorial Day cookout uh, after service. Uh, the grill is under our covering here, so our hospitality team will be cooking hot dogs and burgers. And so uh, please join us for that. I think it'll be a great time of fellowship. Uh, just as our sister Stephanie mentioned, a couple of things that are going on. Uh, starting this Tuesday, we'll be starting our summer family groups. Uh, summer family groups are a great time just to uh, grow together and get to know each other on a deeper level. Uh, we're going to go through this curriculum uh, by a pastor named John Mark Comer. And the curriculum that we're going to go through is the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I've been just looking at this curriculum, and it's been very challenging, actually, on a very personal level, just talking about what it means to slow down, uh, what it means to observe Sabbath. And so I believe it's a five-week study. So we'll, the plan is that we're going to meet, obviously, throughout June, I think the first week of July, and then we're going to take an extended break from community. And so most of July, all of August, and we usually start our family group ministry, usually end of August or beginning of September. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a roadmap where we're going in terms of our community and family groups. And so I hope you could join us for that. Again, uh, it'll be a video study. So the video is about 10 minutes long and it will be breaking up into smaller groups here Tuesday nights. Um, again, I hope you could join us for that. Again, and as a stream mentioned, we'll be having a potluck a couple Fridays from now. This is more just to kick off our summer, but also we wanna send off our Guatemala missions team. So we'll be praying for them. Uh, during this potluck. And so please do keep them in prayer. They're working very hard, learning Spanish, getting all their uh, VBS stuff and their lessons, uh, getting, uh, prepping for all that. And so uh, please do pray for them. And I just wanted to extend just a thank you to our church in terms of your generosity. I know a lot of people within this church and even outside of our church gave to support our team. And they were actually able to raise, I believe, almost all what they were required to, to uh, what they needed to go on this trip and so that really is a testament to our community and your generosity and so just wanted to personally thank you for that all right well today we are in our last message on our series in wisdom and if you've been with us throughout the month of may we've been talking about this topic on the subject of wisdom and why wisdom is so needed in our everyday life uh, first couple of weeks, we talked about the anatomy of wisdom, what wisdom is, why we need wisdom in our everyday life. Last week, we looked at a very specific area of wisdom, talking about uh, the way that we use our words and how our speech is so important when it comes to wisdom. And today, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that's probably not talked about in church. We're going to talk about friendship. And so today, we're going to talk about wise friendship I'm going to read a couple Proverbs for us. I'll pray, and then we'll get into the message. So wise friendships, again, Proverbs 13, 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats the matter separates close friends. Proverbs 18.24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And finally, Proverbs 27.17, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that you've gathered us here together as a church. Uh, Lord, as we go into this summer, uh, Lord, I know personally I'm excited about the things that we'll be doing, just the fellowship we'll have as a community. Lord, we pray that this summer would be a summer that we would desire to grow. I know summer is a time where we're going on vacation, planning on doing a lot of different things, but Lord, I pray our priority as followers of Jesus Christ would be that our priority would be to grow into your likeness. And so we pray that you would speak to us. And even as we conclude our series on wisdom, uh, Lord, each and every week uh, we've been praying as Solomon prayed in 1 Kings chapter 3, that you would indeed give us a heart of wisdom, wisdom in every area of our life, wisdom in our decisions, in our parenting, wisdom in our marriage, in our finances, wisdom in the way that we talk. And Lord, even as we look at this topic of our friendships, 
Lord, give us incredible amount of wisdom uh, with the friends that we have and the friends that we forge. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Uh, Lord, this time is really about you. It's not about any one person or human being, but, Lord, it's about your voice speaking to us. And so, God, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and be present in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said before, we are ending our series on the topic of wisdom. And each and every week, what I've been saying is that we need wisdom in almost every area of our life. In the decisions that we make, in the relationships that we have, in our character that we are trying to form into Christ's likeness. Last week, as I mentioned, we talked about the topic of words, and we looked at James chapter three and how our words are so uh, wisdom is so needed when it comes to our speech and the words that we say. And today, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the topic of friendship. Now, in the church, friendship is probably one of those topics that's seldomly talked about. Uh, we talked about a lot of different relationships, such as marriage and parenting, but I believe that friendship is one of those relationships that's rarely talked about, but it's so vital in our Christian walk. Uh, the reason why it's so important, because we all desire to have friends, or we have friends in our life, and those friends matter in our character and what we live for. Uh, there was a re recent church survey that I read, and basically the church survey asked, are you happy with your church? Are you happy with your church? And interestingly, the level of satisfaction of people being happy with their church were dependent upon two things. The first one was the quality of Sunday service. Do you like the worship? Do you like the preaching? Do you like the community? That was one aspect that they were satisfied with their Sunday experience. And second is, do you have friends in church? Do you have deep relationships where you can share your life with, which is another factor of people's satisfaction when it came to church experience? And so when you think about that, when you think about that survey, again, worship experience is important. Worship preaching is very important, but also the quality of our friendships is also important as well when it comes to satisfaction of church. Now, when it comes to friendship, I just want to take a minute to address specifically men, because I believe in the topic of friendship, men have a serious problem when it comes to forming deep, meaningful friendships. Most men stop making friends after they get married. Most men in their lives, statistically it says, don't have many deep, quality, meaningful friendships in their life. And when men do connect with one another, it's usually very superficial. We usually get together around things like sports or work or poker or hunting or a lot of other things. But usually when it comes to men, our relationships, our friendships don't go very deep. Uh, there was another survey that I read that it said one in 10 men had shared their life, meaning they shared something about their marriage, money, life, or their kids outside of their family. That's a very small percentage. Only one out of 10 men were able to have shared something about their life when it related to money, their life, their marriage, or something, again, that's associated deep in their life. So again, I believe this is a topic for all but especially when it comes to men, we need to really consider friendships in our life because friendships are vital. Look, I hope my, this message is important for all, but again, uh, I think friendship is one of those things that we really want to desire as a community. As a church, we just don't want to come together to be an event or come to events, but we really want to be deeply connected together as a family, as a community in deep friendships. Our hope, and my hope, is that there will be friendships right in our community that will cross ethnic boundaries, age differences, stages of life, because that's what Christian friendships ought to be about. So why talk about this topic of friendship? I just want to give two quick reasons why. Number one, as I said before, it's hard to find quality friends. We are individualistic, busy, transient, and that's why often it's possible to find, impossible to find quality friendship in our lives. If I were to be very specific, I think three things come to mind. We live in a very mobile society, especially nowadays, 
where you can pretty much work from anywhere you want. A lot of our jobs were like that. And so it gives us this ability to be away from our community and from our home. And so if you're only at church one or two times out of the month, it's hard to make friendships in community. Also family life. As our kids grow older, our activities that our kids are involved in take so much time. And so when you're dealing with our family and especially our children, it leaves very little margin to make friendships outside even our family. And I would say technology, even though technology can help us in a lot of ways, it's hurt us to develop deep quality friendships. Isn't it odd that a lot of us were on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we probably have more friends than ever before, but genuine friendship is probably very rare. We have a lot of acquaintances, but I would guess that many of us, we lack true quality friendships in our life. And so I think that's why it's so important to address the topic of friendship. I think the second reason why this topic is so important is because we were made for friendship. We were made for friendship. If you look at the Trinity or the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, uh, God the Son, right? If you think about the, the nature of the Trinity, they were in eternal friendship with one another. If you think about that, from the very beginning of time, God demonstrated true friendship within uh, the Trinity itself. And because we were created like God, we also have a deep longing for true friendship in our life. Not only that, you think about our culture. I'm dating myself a little bit. When you think about shows like, so this is the shows that I grew up with, Cheers, right? A little bit dated. Maybe some of us were into Friends, right? So probably a lot of us, we probably watched The Office. What are these shows all about? They're about friendship, dysfunctional friendships, but they're about friendships, people in relationship and doing life with one another. When you look at the life of Jesus, who did Jesus do ministry with? He did it with his friends, his disciples. The second commandment that Jesus gives us is to what? Love our neighbor as ourself. I believe an aspect of that is friendship. You think about Jesus, what he was called. He was called the friend of sinners. So Jesus himself was a friend to his disciples, but he befriended those even outside his close niche disciples. He didn't start with programs, but he ate with people. He befriended people in his life. And so the problem when it comes to friendship is not that I think we all acknowledge we need friendship, but we all, I think, can admit that some of us, we have very shallow friendships in our life. And so I believe when it comes to friendship for the Christian, it should be deeper, life-giving, and it should be challenging. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time here. So I want to break our message into two parts. We want to look at the value of friendship, then we want to look at the characteristics of friendship, and I want to give us some takeaways and application at the very end. The value of friendship. As we read in these Proverbs, Solomon goes at length to talk about friendship in our everyday life, why we need friends and how our friends shape us. A couple of things that I believe he addresses. Number one, we need companionship. Again, Proverbs 17, 17, a, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. It's interesting because this word companion in the Hebrew is translated into acquaintance. And so the Proverbs here is making a distinction. And the distinction is this. We may know a lot of people in our life, but it doesn't mean that we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so what Solomon is saying when it comes to friendship is that wisdom is trying to find friends who stick closer than a brother. I think one of the dangers of church is that we have a lot of acquaintances. We may know a lot of people. We may know a lot of faces, but not many real friends. And so my prayer is that we would move from acquaintance to friendship. When you look at Paul and Timothy, probably one of the deepest relationships and friendship in scripture, Paul himself wrote letters to Timothy, sharing his life, expressing what he needs for ministry. 
And that's what I hope would happen here at JCC, that we would develop deep, meaningful spiritual friendships in our everyday life. My goal for us as a church is that we would see these kind of friendships, that we will move from acquaintance, just saying hi on a Sunday, but actually doing life together. So how do we move there? I think a couple ingredients. Number one, there needs to be commonality when it comes from moving to acquaintance to friendship. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. Friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. And so what Lewis is saying is that friendship is based on this commonality that we probably actually have more in common than we think. Again, I think one of the, another danger of the church is that we often get together for things that are maybe not essential or not as important. Our deepest commonality as a community is the gospel. And so my hope is that in our friendship, friendships, it will be based upon the gospel. The gospel should be the deepest shared interest among one another. It should be what we talk about, why we gather together, Things like food and football and sports, I love those things. Those are great to talk about, but our greatest common mutuality and commonality should be the gospel. That's why I believe that we can make friends, even in Christian community, despite our age, despite, despite our life stages, despite the different experiences that we have, because the, the gospel goes deep into our lives. I think a second is that we need vulnerability. The way that we move from acquaintance to friendship is that we need to be vulnerable with one another. I think a lot of the reasons why our friendships are very shallow is because we're very private. And some of us are very private, but to actually move from acquaintance to friendship, we need to share our lives. Maybe not with everyone, but there has to be people in community where you share your life with. I think the cross reminds us that we can be free to be transparent. If you think about it, all of us here, we're broken. All of us here, we have issues. All of us here, we don't have a life together, which means that we need the grace of God. That's our commonality. And so I think that should give us a freedom to share our lives with one another, share our hurts, our worries, our anxieties with one another. If Jesus has already accepted us despite our brokenness, why do we fear what people think? It should give us this freedom to be not so private in our lives, but actually open up and be transparent and let people know who you really are. Uh, on a very personal level, uh, I talk with a pastor friend of mine every Thursday morning, and this week we were talking and uh, we've been doing this since COVID. Uh, we just made a, a pact that every Thursday morning, because uh, during COVID, I think a lot of churches were struggling, and so we just made a pact, hey, let's just talk to each other th every Thursday morning, and we just want to share about our life, our ministry, and our marriage. So we've been doing this for a couple of years now, and it's been very life-giving for me. And this actually past week, as I was ta thinking about the topic of friendship, I was just sharing if I would be very transparent about some discouragements in my own personal life in this season. And discouragements about ministry, life, disappointments. And uh, I think every person, but especially a pastor, always asks this question, does my life actually make a difference? And I was just verbally sharing with this friend, hey, I've been kind of doing this for a while, and sometimes I struggle whether my life actually makes a difference. And he said something that I'll never forget. He said, you know, a life lived for the Lord is never wasted. A life lived for the Lord is never wasted. And in that moment, I just felt so encouraged, right, that I had this friend to talk to. But I think it just reminded me, and it should remind us, why vulnerability is so critical to form true, deep friendships in our everyday life. I think a second thing when it comes to the value of friendship is that we need to be sharpened. Again, Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. And so this proverb is teaching us that our friends shape us. They be help us become who we are. Friends influence us, the world around us, the choices that we make, what we set our affections on, our friendships matter. 
If you think about it, if you're a believer in Jesus, our friendships either draw us closer to Jesus or they lead us away from Jesus. I believe there's no neutral friends when it comes to the believer. Are your friends helping you to love Jesus more or they are leading you to love the world more? That's why Proverbs again tells us and reminds us that we need to be wise with the people that you and I associate ourselves with. Friends influence us and that's why we need wisdom. When I became a Christian in college, I had to get new friends. It doesn't mean that I abandoned my old friends. I still kept in touch with them and played sports with them, but I didn't come from a Christian family or Christian background, and so Christian friendship was new to me. And so my friends at the time, our commonality were things like drunkenness, parties, and sports. That's all my friendships were based on in high school. And so what I realized when I became a Christian, I needed deeper, more meaningful friendships. And so I got involved in my community and these friends that were living for Jesus influenced me to keep on living for him. It doesn't mean that we abandon those who may have negative influence. We should be engaging with people and love people. But I would say our closest relationships and friendships should be the one that point us to Christ. I think that's why the importance of the local church is so vital. Because here in the local church, it should be a place where you get sharpened, where people help you to become like Jesus. In the community of faith, it's a place where you can not only share your life, but people can encourage you and spur you on to help you become like Jesus. And so again, I think the value of the local church is so vital when it comes to friendships and forming us to become like him. So what makes a good friend? We wanna just briefly talk about what are the characteristics of a wise friend. Proverbs has a lot to say. I think a wise friend, number one, is constant, is constant. Proverbs 17, 17, again, it says, a friend loves at all times. A friend loves at all times. We live in a world where a lot of our friends or friends that we see are very fair weathered or fickle. When you're doing well, they're with you. When you're doing terrible, maybe they're gone. So the definition of what Proverbs says here is that a friend who loves at all times is someone that you could turn to in all seasons of life. Do you have a friend like that? A friend who doesn't abandon you, especially during hard times. That's what the Proverbs writer is exhorting us and challenging us challenging us when it comes to our friendships. I think one of the best examples of this is the friendship between David and Jonathan. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, it said that Jonathan made a covenant with David, meaning that there was this deep, unbreakable bond and friendship that they had with one another. This covenant that they made simply expressed, I am never gonna leave you. No matter what happens to you, David, I am never going to leave you. And we see this carried out or lived out in 1 Samuel chapter 23 where David was deeply discouraged. And the text says that Jonathan came along David and strengthened David's hands in the Lord, simply meaning that he reminded David about the promises of God. That's what a friend does. When it comes to Christian friendship, Friends around us should give, remind us the promises of God. That's how we continue to live this race. And that's what Jonathan did for David. Do you have friends like that? People who remind you the promises of God, that God is faithful, that God is a, a provider, that God is with you no matter what season of life that you're in. As I mentioned last week, and probably a lot of us have heard that Pastor Tim Keller passed away last week. And I was just reading a lot of articles this past week of just the man that he was. And he wrote something interesting about his marriage to his wife, Kathy. And he said that during the hard times of his life, especially as he was going through his cancer treatment, it wasn't the romantic parts of his relationship that helped uh, or just um, in the other parts of marriage, but it was the friendship aspect of his marriage that helped him through the most difficult seasons of his life. Uh, because she was a soulmate, it really helped him as he was going through cancer and different things. And that's the kind of friend that we need. That's the kind of friend that Jonathan was to David. 
And that's what I hope that that kind of friendship would be built here at JCC. I think a second aspect of friendship or characteristic is a wise friend is candid. A wise friend is candid. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, again, it is better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And so again, another characteristic of a wise friend is a friend ought to be candid. We should be candid with one another. If friendship is going to go deep, there has to be an aspect of honesty. True friends in love learn how to confront one another when they are doing wrong, especially when they are headed down the wrong path. I think another way to put it when you look at this proverb is that we need moments in our friendship where we're okay rebuking one another. Again, speaking the truth in love to correct our friends because that's what love, how love should be expressed, especially in our friendship. I think a reason for this is because sin easily deceives us. We all have blind spots in our character and in our life, and that's what the, the reason for friendship is all about because our friends in love should help point us out different character flaws or areas where we are blind to. And that's why the Proverbs writer says, again, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Hidden love is not saying anything, but true friendship helps us because friends should help us to see areas where we're blinded to. It reminded me when I took my kids to the carnival a long time ago. And if you've ever been to a carnival, if you ever see these mirrors where they kind of exaggerate your figure, sometimes you walk past this and sometimes you have like huge legs or a huge head. And it's really funny because my kids were a lot, lot younger at the time, but they, they would just crack up. They would go, go in this mirror and just saw the exaggerated state of who they actually were. And I think the same way, that's, the way that we often see ourselves. Because of sin, we often have an inaccurate picture of our own self and our character. And that's why we need friendships and friends who are honest enough to help us along and to even maybe speak words of rebuke. That's what a wise friend does. One pastor, David Mathis, he puts it like this. Often it is easier for others in our lives not to say anything but just let us go merrily on our way down the path of folly and death. But reproof or rebuke is an act of love, a willingness to own that awkward moment and perhaps having your counsel thrown back in your face for the risk of doing someone good. When a spouse or friend or family member or associate rises to the level of such love, we should be profoundly thankful. And I love what he says here because we should desire that kind of friendship. I know I've certainly had friendship, and even now, where people have spoken hard truth in my life, which I needed, maybe not at the time I wanted, but I needed looking back, and that's what a true friend does. I think a third characteristic that we see is a wise friend is compassionate. A wise friend is compassionate. Proverbs 17, 9, again, says, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Here's another reality, that you and I will be disappointed in our friendships. At some point, our friends will let us down. What the proverb writer is reminding us of is that in our friendships, we need to remember that we need to learn how to cover people's offenses. I think simply put, learning how to love and forgive those that we are friends with. He says, love that covers offenses. Then really what he's saying is that we should have this aspect of learning to let go of things in our friendships. I think one question that we need to ask ourselves is when it comes to our friends, do we only see the faults of our friends? Maybe our spouse, maybe our friends around us. And what the Proverbs writer reminds us of is that love covers all offenses. To be a real friend is to have compassion and be able to forgive. If our friend is working on an area and making progress, it's not necessary that we point out their issue over and over and over again. 
The apostle Peter repeats this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. He says, love covers a multitude of sins. If you think about it, the relationships that you and I have, friendships and even outside of friendship, our marriages, kids, roommates, before, you know, all, all around us, We have an opportunity to apply this in our everyday life. When there is division, bitterness, and anger in our friendships and in the church, I believe it's a lack of following or applying this passage in our everyday life. Our motivation is that God has covered all our offenses. In Ephesians, Paul reminds us that Christ has forgiven us, and that's why we are called to forgive those around us. So when it comes to friendship and community, again, are you and I the type of person that is constant, that is candid and compassionate? Because that's the kind of relationships that we need to build this kind of community. So I just want to leave us with a couple applications. Where does this leave us when it comes to friendship? I think number one, as I mentioned before, choose your close friendships wisely. Choose your close friendships wisely wisely. Uh, One of the passages that we've been saying over and over again in this series is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Walk with the wise and become wise. So how do you become wise? Proverbs says it right here. You walk with the wise, and that should be included in our friendships. Our friendships shape our characters. Community shapes you. Friendships shape you. Uh, A pastor named Greg Crochelle He said it like this, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And what he's saying is this, that you and I are made up of the average of our five closest friends. And so what he's saying is this, you look at your five closest friends and if you wanna become a better parent or a better student or a better worker, then maybe we need to surround ourselves with better friendships. If you wanna be a more solid Christian, You need to find people in your life that are growing in their faith. Again, it doesn't mean that you abandon your friends or your current friend group. That's not what my point here is. But our closest friendships should draw us to Jesus, encourage us, and help us to become more like him. I think that's the wisdom, again, in friendship that Proverbs is talking about. Tim Keller, I love what he says. He puts it like this. Spiritual friendship is eagerly helping one another know, serve, and love and resemble God in deeper and deeper ways. Is that what your friendships look like? That you have friends who know, serve, love, and resemble God in deeper and deeper ways. I think a second takeaway is that we need to become a wise friend. I know in a message like this, often the question is, I don't have these kind of friends. I want these kind of friends. And I would say this, we need to ask ourselves, are we this kind of person? Are we extending this kind of friendship to the people around us? Am I a person who is constant, who is candid, who is compassionate? I've met with people in our church who are longing for friendship. It's very common. No matter what church setting you're in, people are longing for friendship. Now, I would say the first place that we need to start is, am I this kind of friend? We want this kind of friend. I want this kind of friend. But are we this kind of friend? I believe that there is potential even in our community. We are a smaller community. There's so much potential for friendship in in our community. People that you would have never thought would be your friend. College students, young adults, married couples. It just takes intentionality and asking ourselves, am I being this kind of person? Am I trying to develop these kind of friendships within our community? And lastly, where do we get the power for this? We look to our ultimate friend. We look to our ultimate friend. If we are to have friendships like this, we need to look to our true and ultimate friend, Jesus himself. Think about the kind of friend Jesus was. Jesus was a friend that didn't seek out his own advantage, but rather look out for the uh, interests of his friends. He laid down his life for us. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, he says that he will never leave us or forsake us. He is the ultimate friend. And I want to conclude with this. In John chapter 15, verse 13, when he's talking to his disciples, he puts it like this. 
Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. That's the kind of friend Jesus is. One who would lay down his life. One who would stick closer than a brother. If you look at the friendship of Jesus, he is committed to us, loves us unconditionally, and that's where you and I get the power to be a friend. The hymn writer puts it like this, and we'll close with this. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs and trials to bear. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's pray and close our time together.